Hello everyone, this is Venom Geek Media here, and today we are picking up on a little topic that we started uh, sort of in the last phase of videos, where we discussed the Vulcan Dekia. And I said in that video that I would then look more broadly at the Vulcan fleet of the 22nd century, its composition and its tactics. Yeah, without any further ado, let's get into it. So, it goes very much without saying that the Vulcans are the quote-unquote superpower of the 22nd century. Now, that's what I've used in the video title because it grabs attention. Is that really accurate? No, I wouldn't say that anyone is a superpower in the 22nd century. I would say that the Vulcans are a great power or a strong regional power in as much as anyone can be a, a great power in the 22nd century with the much more primitive technology. So, it is certainly the most dominant power of the 22nd century, or among the most dominant, um, certainly of what we see. In this video, what we'll really be covering are the ships and the formations that they'll use and the tactics. So, first thing we'll do is we'll go through all the various ship classes and then we'll cover the organization and their tactics. So let's get into it. So the first ship to talk about is the Deval Corvette. Now this is seen in a couple episodes of Enterprise. It's actually used as a sort of Vulcan fighter slash shuttlecraft, depending on how it's scaled. We see it in episode Carbon Creek, where it's actually quite large. And then we'll later see it in the Enterprise episode Awakening, I think, where it shoots at the Enterprise shuttle. Now, that in that episode, it's scaled down to be way, way, way smaller. But looking at the actual 3D model, but looking at the windows, it looks like it's got a size of around about 60 meters, which makes a lot of sense. Most ships or most powers in the 22nd century have a corvette slash gunboat that is around about 60 meters. It's a very, very common practice to have these sort of small 60 meter corvettes. They're not like attack ships because they're far more limited in their capability. So they're not like 24th century attack ships. They're much more limited in their capabilities and very much play a supporting role most of the time. Do not confuse them with uh, 24th century style attack ships. Those are a very different kettle of fish. But that's the Deval. You can also see with its engine pods, it actually has probably some common DNA with the Teplana Hath. Now probably what it was is that the Teplana Hath is a older vessel, an older science ship, and this in many ways was perhaps the successor to the Teplana Hath. It uses similar engine units, but unlike the Teplana Hath, which is very passive, as a design and not necessarily the most combative of vessels. The Deval is very much built for speed and agility and its ability to fight. That is very, very clear from how we see it employed in Enterprise and how we see the Vulcans employ it. We certainly never see the Deplana Hath going into battle. So it's, it's safe to say that this is a more recent design that is in line with the more belligerent Vulcan High Command. So that's the smallest, it's small corvette. It's also capable of landing, it has landing gear, which would mean it's a pretty effective troop carrier. You could carry, you know, 60 meters long, you can carry a decent number of Vulcan troops into battle using this kind of ship. Large numbers of troops to the surface, while also having a lot of firepower to back them up. In terms of its firepower, we're looking at three plasma cannons. One fore, and then two aft, which is very interesting that they're much more concerned with that vulnerable aft. It's going to be very much in its tactical repertoire to make overshoot passes. So you're going to fire your prow plasma cannon, overshoot the target, fire your rear plasma cannons. So in terms of its actual warp speed performance and range, we don't know. I would speculate that individually it's probably quite a short range vessel and so is going to be largely reliant on the Dekia as a carrier. If it's going to go on any kind of long range expeditionary operations, it's going to have to be supported by a Dekia or a large mothership of some description. Like most corvettes of the 22nd century, these are very short range, 
very limited in their use, very limited mission profile. But, and it's small and cheap. Right, so the next ship to talk about is going to be the Volkas class frigate. Now, yeah, this is where we get into a bit of a funny bit of continuity where in when we first see it in Fusion, it's described as an old retired design. And then we'll later see it throughout Season 4 of Enterprise being a pretty significant part of the Vulcan fleet. Now, I have no doubt that when Topol said it was retired, it may well have been retired, at least on paper. Again, we're dealing with the Vulcan High Command of Administrator Velas, which is incredibly duplicitous and militaristic. I wonder who that reminds you of. In any case, it's highly likely that these old Volkas class frigates were taken aside and retrofitted to be useful in a modern battle space. Its main claim to fame is that it is capable of launching photonic torpedoes. It has two photonic torpedo tubes underneath either side of the deflector. Now that gives it quite a distinct advantage. Not many ships in the 22nd century period carry photonic weapons. It's just not a particularly common weapon system. It's also a pretty inconsistent weapon and particle cannons are favoured for a reason by most of the powers of the Galactic North. They equip the Volkas with photonic torpedoes because they recognise that it is an emergent technology and should be trialled in some form. So in terms of how it then fits into the fleet, it's a basically a medium range vessel, you know, frigate, small general purpose, can do most tasks, a pretty common ship around Vulcan space and perhaps not all of them are retrofitted with armaments, but certainly those operated specifically by the military section of the high command are equipped with photonic weapons and those are the ones that bombard the forge in the Enterprise episode, The Awakening. Apart from its photonic torpedoes, it has a single plasma cannon, so it's relatively limited in terms of what it can do apart from using its torpedoes. Overall, yes, it's been refitted, and yes, it's, you know, somewhat combat capable in the environment of the, the mid-22nd century, but it is going to lose out, we'll see, when we do a comparison, it will lose out to more specialist craft developed specifically for that role. So we will next come to the Surak class. Now, it's basically the same shape as the Sharan, uh, but it's an older design. We can probably, we can tell that it's an older design by the fact that it is a more red hull plating, which is very, very similar to the Toplana Hath. So it's probably from a similar-ish era, so maybe even older than the Volkas as well. So essentially the Surak fits the role of a light cruiser, much like its larger cousin, the Sharan. It's got it's got a full annular warp ring, and that gives it incredible warp speed. Even for a ship of its age, it's a fast ship, and it's decent size as well. So it's very good for exploration and patrol. The Vulcans use these really to bulk out their fleet and use it to take on the assignments that. You know, need a significant ship, but not your biggest ships. And so that's really what the Surak takes on. It takes on sort of a general purpose workhorse role. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it sort of thing. Now, in terms of its tactical capabilities, again, it's quite limited. We were looking at four plasma cannons. That's all right, but it's going to, again, struggle against more modern vessels. What you have with this is speed, it is extremely fast, and again you have decent numbers of them, and particularly, again, individually these aren't perhaps the most capable ships, but when supported properly by, say, a few Valkas, well now you're, now you're talking, and now you're talking about a combat presence that is actually quite modern in its capabilities, although even if it's individual parts are actually quite antiquated. But it's good for force recon and exploration. You might not see them directly very often in a combat situation, but they are there because a ship of that kind of size doing reconnaissance, again, particularly if you pair it up with the Dakia support craft, well then again, you've got a very fast, very agile uh, and decently powerful reconnaissance element, which means it's going to be capable of penetrating 
pretty deep into the enemy area of operations, get the most critical intel, and then get back safely. Now, following on from the Surak is its larger descendant, the Sharan class cruiser. The Sharan is actually, again, you can see, very much based on the same design. It's a little bit modified to be a bit, it's obviously a bit bigger, more powerful, faster, more powerful engine, more powerful warp ring. It is basically the main expeditionary Vulcan capital ship. This is the one that, when they're just kind of doing general exploring, this is the biggest one they'll send out. They won't send out the Dakir. The Dakir is very much in the combat role. The Sharan is your general exploration and diplomatic vessel. It has a few interesting alterations from its smaller cousin. So, unlike the Surak, which has a shuttle bay on either side of the central spear, you instead have the shuttle bays located in the stem of the Sharan. So, in that very large stem that goes down to the warp ring, you have a shuttle bay. You also have at the bottom of the stem, you have the uh, bridge. The bridge is actually... Uh, on the bottom of the stem, but you also have what looks like torpedo tubes. It looks like the Sharan actually is capable of firing photonic torpedoes from that stem. Although we never see it observed, it does look very much like that's where you would fire your photonic weapons from. It looks like a torpedo launcher or a torpedo pod. It also is armed with seven plasma cannons located around the surface of the ship, and it has much like its larger cousin, the Dakir, it has dual navigational deflectors. The Vulcans are very keen on that. I'm not quite sure why, but we can assume there is a reason for it, possibly to do with sensor output, being able to use one as a deflector and one as a sensor, possibly. Now, it is fast and very powerful and very good range as well, partially due to its speed. It can cover a lot of distance very quickly. There's very little out there that can really challenge the Sharan. It is a very, very powerful ship of its of its time. The only ship that can really come close to challenging it is the Andorian Kumari, which can exploit a lot of its weaknesses. It's worth saying that with pretty much all these Vulcan ships, apart from the two smallest, when I say they're fast, I just mean fast in a straight line. None of these are particularly maneuverable, especially the Surak and the Sharan. They are not very agile. They can't turn very quickly. Once they've committed to a to a line, they're committed to it. And, you know, they better hope it pays off. Because if it doesn't, you know, they're going to be up a very bad place with a, without a paddle. Yes, that's the, that's the Sharan. So it's their main diplomatic and exploration vessel and also does do some combat duty they don't really like using it for combat too much although it certainly can take care of itself if they are really going in for a fight the vulcans will rely on the dakir so let's talk about the dakir we already covered it in a dedicated ship chat I'll just recap some of the details. It's got 13 plasma cannons. It's got two docking ports for support craft. It's got a ventral shuttle bay. It also, of course, has its support craft and its and its warp ring can rotate inside the ship's mass, so it is protected in combat. It is essentially a command ship and dreadnought without any parallel. There's nothing really out there that can match the power of a Dakir class. It's also a little bit more maneuverable than the Surak and the Sharan. It has dual impulse engines and they're sort of better spaced apart, unlike those on the Surak and the Sharan, which are basically just on the stem of the ship. This is on either side of the aft section and that gives the Dakir a lot more mobility compared to what are actually smaller ships. This is because the Dakir is very much intended to go diving headfirst into the line of battle, into the melee. And when you do that, when you particularly when you're engaged in a lot of CQB, which is what the Dakir is intended to do, you do have to be actually reasonably maneuverable. Because of course, when you're engaging at such close ranges, it's very easy for the enemy to to move out of an arc. You don't need to be the most agile ship, but you need the ability to turn to keep the enemy in your most favoured weapon arcs or your most favoured shield arcs, depending on what kind of posture you're in. 
So that's the Vulcan fleet of the 22nd century. Those are the ships that compose it. So now we'll look at a couple formations. So formation we can look at is the Light Squadron. And this is composed of two Deval and two Valkas. This is very much the building blocks of the aggressive and militant element of the Vulcan fleet. Not all Vulcan ships are warships. What we're looking at here is the building blocks of that tactical, that aggressive, expeditionary Vulcan war fleet. So that, the basic building block of that is the Light Squadron with two Deval and two Valkas. Take four of those, you form that into a skirmish line, which you sort of will attach to the flank of a fleet. It does some general skirmishing, it will clear away small fighters and it will protect the capital ships. You also have some limited capacity there because of your Valkas to strike at enemy capital ships with your photonic torpedoes. Anyway, if you take a light squadron and then add a Dakia to it, you get a battle squadron. Pretty simple, you then have a command ship and some firepower behind you, you can do some damage. Now if you take four of these battle squadrons, you get a battle group. And that's basically four Dakias plus the attached Devals and Valkas. This is a pretty potent force and this is the main combat force that the Vulcans will use in any kind of expeditionary warfare. These are the ships that they will be using. You'll notice that actually, aside from the Dakia, the ships are very small, very cheap and very expendable. And the Vulcans can very much rely on a combination of numbers backed by firepower. There's an interesting sort of give and take there. And actually, in some ways, he might is imitated by later powers like the Dominion, which place a lot of emphasis on a lot of small attack ships supported by a few large capital grade ships. But those are the formations of the main Vulcan battle fleet. Now in terms of the more exploration oriented fleet, this organization's a little bit looser but they will try to keep their ships within this, this framework of support and be able to muster these kind of formations in a relatively uh, timely fashion. So you have a patrol which is just two Vulcas now, if you take two patrols and put them with a Surak, so that's four Volkas and a Surak, you get a Lance, which is, again, a much more capable sort of general purpose force, but still relatively light. It's only a Surak. Now, if you take two of those and add a Sharan into the mix, you get a Strike Force, a force which is, well, you can kind of guess what it's meant to do by its name. It's meant to muster very quickly. Again, unlike a lot of a lot of the main Vulcan battle fleet, which will actually take a long time to get together, get the ships all into an operable state, get them properly fueled up and, and rearmed and everything. Unlike the Vulcan battle fleet, these strike forces can operate at a very high level readiness and can be mustered very quickly to respond to an emergent threat which when you're the Vulcans and you've got uh, a lot of borders and a lot of hostile aliens that need to be reminded of their place, having a strike force is a very quick and effective way of carrying that out. And again, there's very, very little out there, again, aside from really the Andorians, that are capable of stopping a Vulcan strike force. Now, in terms of actual numbers, you have... Three Dakir battle groups, which is 60 ships. You have four strike forces, which is another 44 ships. And then you have three skirmish lines, which are generally paired up with the uh, Dakir battle groups. And that's another 24 ships. In total, we're looking at a fleet of about 128 ships. Now, I should emphasize here that those are military ships or the explicitly military ships there are probably ships belonging to the vulcan science directorate and so on and so forth other various scientific groups and civilian groups this is the vulcan high command fleet the fleet that is intended not only for the defense of vulcan but also for the expansion of its territories and the expansion of its influence throughout the quadrant that is what composes it now you might say 
130 ships is small, but this is the 22nd century. And bearing in mind how many of those are these big ships like the Dakir and Surak, you don't necessarily need that much in the way of numbers because you have size and firepower on your side. And again, the Vulcans probably actually have a very long and extensive reserve of vessels which they could, if needed, retrofit for combat and, and bring those into action as well. You know, aside from ships like the Vulcas and Surak, there are probably even older vessels which they could uh, reactivate for combat. Not that you'd want to be in that position, but you certainly can if you need to. So, yeah, that's the Vulcan fleet of the 22nd century. So, it's pretty clear why the Vulcans were so powerful and so feared in the 22nd century. You have a collection of some very, very powerful ships organized into some very coherent and effective formations that operate on a pretty decent level of, of scale. These are some of the most powerful ships of the 22nd century. Next week, we're going to look at the fleet that was intended to defeat the Vulcans. Thank you all for watching. I will now thank my members. My Navarx, David Reeves, Jeffrey Ballard, and Tully DT. My Commanders, Miami Jewels, Captain's Quarters, Chase Rector, PQSK, Philip Ty, Jeff Hallam, Bird Monster, Mark Philippe, Robert Sampson, Sean Farrell, Guillermo Martinez, Das Blas, Adam Bowman, and Nathaniel Mead. And I salute my Centurions, Pendleberry, BOS Domestic Disputes, Marcus Hall, Paul Lash, Julian Arnott, Freedom Trooper, Oculcatum Quaesto, Squadra Course, and Gabe Logan. Thank you guys for supporting the channel, and I will see you all in the next video.